Good morning, everybody. Buenos días a todos. Daniel Spatz desde California. Buenas tardes, buenas noches para Europa. Good, good evening, good night for Europe, good afternoon for uh, the rest of the, the world, South America, USA. We are in the West Coast, California. Daniel Spatz, Daniel Spatz interviews. Uh, English today, we're going to have an English interview. A special guest is Sammy Jamalba, a American player, a current he owns an academy in Houston. Texas, and he was a former um, 28 in the world in singles in eight, 1985 and 22 in the world in doubles as well. So Sammy has an amazing career. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, his um, achievements, what is going on with tennis in the USA. Vamos a hablar del tenis. Quédense, tienen que aprender inglés. You have to practice English, guys. Eh? It's important. So, Maxi, how are you doing, everybody? English today, you have to understand. So, um, you have to do your homework. Eh? You have to study English. It's good to open, be open-minded. Jamal Belit, I'm going to connect right now with Sammy, right now. Um, Abrazos La Pampa from Argentina. Yes. We are here with Sammy. Very, very happy. Let's see how the connection. Hey, Sammy, how are you? Hi, Daniel. How are you? Oh, we we just we were connected a few seconds ago. <laughs> yeah, it's great, wonderful. Uh, uh, it's great to see you. Uh, is possible to place the phone a little bit away from your face? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's too close. Okay. Oh, right there. Perfect. Can, can you hear me well, Sammy? What's that? Can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you fine. Thank Fantastic. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I'm telling having... everybody it's going to be in English. Uh, I love it. <laughs> so, Sammy, it's a pleasure having you in my, in my show. Thank you, Daniel. I'm happy to be here. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me ask you. Um, uh, you are in Houston, right? Right now? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Tell us, tell everybody about what are you exactly doing now? I presented you as a former tennis player. Never former. You're a tennis player the rest of yeah, your life, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I, um, I've um, owned a club for the last 21 years. Um, and we have a tennis academy here. And um, it's a great club. We have a great program. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, to see kids come and go here and um, become good players, become you know, develop character. Um, and it's been a great project. Uh, so it's provided a livelihood for me. And so I, I love that. I have, I'm married and I have three children and they're almost grown now. And I'm really proud of them. So it's been a, it's been a, a good life since the tour. Sammy, is any of your kids a tennis player? Or, or... My, my son played uh, one year for A&M, and uh, he was a good tennis player, uh, and, and he worked really hard at it. He, he, uh, he liked tennis. He didn't, he didn't love it like, like what you need to love to want to play the tour. So, um, but he did really well and uh, got, got into A&M from it, and that's a great program. And, uh, and now he's working in commercial real estate, so I'm re really proud of him. He's doing well. Wonderful. I want to uh, take advantage, uh, Corte Contreras, to say hi. Thank you so much for his uh, job, uh, getting us together, eh? you know? Connecting. Yeah, Cote is yeah, Cote's, uh, a great coach here. He works with the kids, really cares about the kids, and does those little extra things that make it, you know, that make coaching uh, – productive and helpful for the kids. We have also uh, watching us from Switzerland, Gustavo Carbonari, former Argentinian player, professional player. He's oh, a coach wow. now. Wow. Uh, he's, so we have viewers from, from Europe, from South America, all over the world, Sammy. Wow, wow. So yeah, and, uh, uh, and actually everybody's gonna watch this later in YouTube in my channel, so uh, oh. it's great. So let me ask you this. Um, you stopped uh, your tennis career in 1990, right? You, 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 I learned around 1990? 80, 1989. 89, okay, yeah. okay. Okay, and then I learned, let me, tell me if I'm wrong. You went to college? You, yes, you went I went to college. 
And How was that? I mean, normally it happens before, right? You turn pro. Yeah, so, so I did my last year, uh, last two years of high school on the road and traveling and stuff. And mm -hmm. I felt like there was a real gap in my education and um, the disciplines of, of learning. And I just, I felt a little bit, uh, I felt, and I really was kind of at a crossroads where I really didn't know what to do after the circuit. You know, I played the circuit. I, the last four or five years, I was going through the motions a little bit. I really didn't have my heart into it but I didn't really know what to do. So that gave me four years to kind of, it was really a good discipline to have to take that focus and, and energy and apply it to college. And so it was, it was great. I loved it. I got a lot out of, out of college and then, uh, uh, and it gave me some time to kind of figure out what I wanted to do. And uh, after after I graduated, I worked two years for investment banking, and those oh, are really? yeah. So you so study? Was, sorry, you, your degree was business, I guess, administration. Yeah, yeah and that's and that those are crazy hours. And, and but really, tell me, Sammy, before you go ahead, I love this. Yeah. Uh, what when you were in school, right? After playing the tour for ten years, about right. ten years, how do you feel sitting, studying, listening to teachers when you were outside your whole life? Uh, I mean. I mean, I was humbled. I, I, you know, I struggled my first semester, uh, um, you know, and these kids were really smart. And uh, so it was more just humbled with the teachers and they were experts in their field. And I could really appre appreciate their, mm. you know, and they really cared about what they did. And so, uh, uh, but it was interesting because, you know, the work ethic that you do for any kind of sports or anything, any any kind of passion that you pursue, that that discipline and that work ethic, you really can apply to other other areas if you you know. And so I felt, you know, I learned how to take that what what you know that energy that I put into tech, uh, tennis and that focus and everything, and I could apply it to school. And and then I went into investment banking and I did that, and that really helped me. I wasn't the smartest kid, but I. Uh, I worked really hard at school and I, I did well. Uh, I mean, reasonably well. And uh, I wasn't the greatest investment banker. I made a lot of really stupid <laughs> mistakes and I was really green, but, but I worked hard. And so, uh, you know, I could overcome a lot of, a lot of things through just, you know, fortitude and just kind of pushing through and working hard. How the idea, Sammy, to have a tennis academy started? Well, uh, you know, after two years of investment banking, you know, the, the kind of the track is to either go to business school or uh, they offered me a, like a little promotion there, like to, to be, you know, an, uh, an investment banking, it goes like analyst is like kind of the bottom of the totem pole, which I was, mm -hmm. and then it, it's like an associate. So they said, okay, you can be associate here and keep working here. And the partner there was helping me try to get into business schools and stuff like that. And then I just, I decided like, I'm, I'm never going to be a really great investment banker or thing. And I, and I, I didn't really have a super passion for it. I mean, I, I liked the work and I respected the people and I liked the people there. So, mm. but I didn't have a passion. I was like, you know, why don't, uh, tennis is a good life. And I saw what my dad was a tennis pro and I, you know, I mean, I, I really like that. And I, and being away from it, I realized, you know, I kind of miss it. And I thought, you know, what, what the heck, I, I give it a couple of years and try it out. And if I'm, if I like it, I'll stay at it. And so during the applying for business school, I applied for a director of tennis at this one country club and I got it. And so I had a decision and, and I just decided, you know, I'm going to get back into tennis and see, see how that goes. And, um, so that's what I did. So you started, uh, also you have a brother, right? Uh, was it? I, I have a brother, brother. yeah. 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 And, my, and my brother, I always kind of followed my brother's pathway. Like with tennis, he, he did well. And so that was that kind of, he always set the standard. And then when he finished the tour, he went and he went to business school, he went to Cornell Business School, and then he went into uh, finance and he, he ended up having his own hedge fund and he 
did really well. And it was, so I was kind of following my brother's footsteps a little bit just because he always kind of paved the, the way of, hey, this is the way you do it. And so, but I saw my dad and so, I, okay, that's another mm -hmm. pathway. And my father, my parents had a really rich life. They didn't make a lot of money, but um, my dad had a lot of kids that would call him for his birthday and, you know, mm -hmm. tell him what an impact they, he made on their lives. And I saw a lot of joy with him. And as a kid raising up from a father, he always gave us the time and stuff. And um, I was a little concerned, like I was getting married my second year in investment banking. And I was like, I, I might not, I might not have that time that my dad was able, you know, that he was so present in our lives. I might not have that with my kid if I did investment banking. And I could just see myself getting a little lost in that, so. Um, yeah, so Sammy, you were as high as 28 in the world in singles, 22 in doubles. Yeah. Uh, reached the quarterfinals of the Australian Open, fourth round of Wimbledon, third round of the French. U.S. Open, sorry, second. I mean, you did amazing in, in singles and then doubles also very well. But but um, back in the days, being 28 in the world, compared with now, 28 in the world, uh, money-wise, I don't want to go through details how much money you, you made in the tour, but right. it's a huge difference, right? No, it, it definitely is. Uh, I, um, you know, I did well very young. So when I was seven or eight, when I turned 18, I think I was eight, uh, top 30 in the world. And so because of that, I, I got contracts. So I, I did pretty well financially for that time. But yeah, the money's much better. But I would never complain about the money I made. I almost felt like I made too much money uh, for the player that I was. I, I felt like I could, I could have been, you know, uh, so I, I'm happy with what I got from the circuit. I, you know, I, I think I did very, you know, well financially. It, it's actually, you know, helped me. I, you know, I, I don't spend a lot, so I live pretty modestly. And um, so it's, I just put that money away and it's really been just there for, for my, you know, family if we have things, so. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, now everybody talks about the big three. Novak, Roger, Rafa, right? In the last probably 10, 12 years. But when you play, my friend, when you play, we had McEnroe, uh, Connors, Borg, Villas. Uh, I would say those, they were the big three, right? Back yeah. Then. So, yeah. And then later on, McEnroe, Lendl, Becker, Edberg. Yeah, yeah. So tell us, you played in that time. Yeah. I know you played Connors. You lost yeah. to Connors, right? And uh, Wimbledon in the first right. round. Right. Uh, you play Villas in Houston, the final. Uh, man, you, you play. Have you played Bjorn Borg? I played Borg when I was uh, 16 or 17. Wow. In the quarterfinals of. How, of how was this like? Tell us. Borg, people Borg, love these Borg stories. I'm playing these guys. Yeah. Borg was just so cool and, and uh, such an amazing athlete. And, you know, he was just kind of a. I felt like he was a stud. And I just always admire him. And so when I played him I was I was just in awe of playing him he was I think Borg would have you know those guys made up it was the first time of big money and so mm. I think those Borg McEnroe and Connors uh didn't have their eye on history they were just like okay let's make money we're making a lot of money and this is and I could be wrong I don't want to speak for but it seemed like that it didn't seem like the motivation was to play all the grand slams they didn't play mm. the Australian and uh, they would, you know, and, and like Connors didn't play the French. And so I, I think they, those guys would have won a lot more majors than they, mm -hmm. um, than what they actually did if they had that eye for history. But so they were really great players, but Borg was, Borg was a phenomenal athlete and so dominant on clay. Like he'd win the finals of the French, like two, two and two. I mean, he destroyed everyone and he was like, I don't know, I just really, um, he was kind of a stud and like super cool. He won five straight Wimbledons. I mean, uh, and then he just kind of called it quits. I think McEnroe beat him at that Wimbledon and, and then he was beating him in the US Open. And 
so I think it kind of hurt his motivation and he, he put so much into it, he, he quit. And But okay. Sammy, tell, tell us about playing against those guys, Villas, Connors. How, how was it like to be, take us to the, through the time uh, tunnel, you standing in one side of the net and having these guys across the net. Well, Borg was super, I, when I played Borg, I was 17 and he, he came up to me and he introduced himself to me. He stuck out his hand and he said, hi, my name's Bjorn Borg. And this wow. is like an idol that I like, and just like so humbly and just such a nice guy. And, and, uh, and so, uh, so we went out there and like my knees were shaking. I, my, he I mean, was like, sorry. He was already number one, right? Oh yeah. I mean, he had won like four or five Wimbledon's at that time. And when I went out to play and my knees were, I was, I mean, I've never been like that, but my knees were, you know, like they do the cartoons and your knees are like, mm. just like, that's the way my legs were. I could not. And when I played him, his shots were, you know, top spin, but they were kind of short. And so, you know, you could, I felt like I could play, but you felt like you, I felt like I would hit a good shot to put him out of position and he went, he'd be right. It wouldn't even like uh, hurt him at all because he moved so well. He, his movement was by far the best. So, um, and then after the match, he was, uh, he came up and he said, or no, his coach came up, Berglund came up to me and said, you know, you need to work on your serve. Uh, you know, you're, you're, but you're, you know, you're, you know, keep working at it. You know, you, you've got a shot at this or something like that. Or he, he said, he, was, he encouraged me. I don't know if it was those words, but it was very encouraging. So. Oh, Sammy, we are losing uh, your face a little bit. Right, right there, right there. Thanks, okay. thanks. You know what? Now it's not, I don't see now, I can't imagine other coaches talking to the rival that say, yeah. listen, you have to work on your fork. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I think it was, Uh, there were some really, it was kind of just that, that the era I was in was kind of bridging kind of from the Australians to nowadays where everyone has their own private coach. There's still a little bit more of a camaraderie and especially in, you know, 80, they're just kind of, it's kind of the tour, the tour was beginning to change then people were starting to get coaches. And so it was, it was changing a little bit, but, um, How about Connors, Vilas, having these guys across the net, playing against them? Connors wasn't as nice, I would say. Connors was kind of, uh, but Connors, you know, you just, I just admired, he was so tenacious and uh, he just didn't give you any, anything. And he just fought and he, he would, in team tennis, when I played him, he'd talk to you on the changeover, like he kind of trash talk you, like you're going to choke here, or you're going to choke. Oh, so, yeah, he'd do a little bit of that. Um, but he was uh, at like Wimbledon. He we played a close first set and then he just destroyed me after that. Uh, he just kept lobbing. And oh, uh, every time I came in and he was just um, you just, were you were your, your game plan was attacking him coming in. Well, I was on grass. So, yeah, I was coming in. He just kept lobbing over me. When you played Connors, I always, when I played him, I always felt rushed. You know, I just never felt like I could get any kind of rhythm. That ball came back so quick because he took it so early and he hit it so flat. So Sorry, uh, Sammy, before you continue, uh, don't you think he was ahead of time uh, in that thing of taking the ball on the rise? Oh, yeah. I mean, yes. I mean, it was a, a, different, um, a different way of playing. I think Agassi kind of Uh, did that, uh, you know, mimic that a little bit. Uh, but with Connors, he hit a little flatter. And mm. uh, so you really felt rush. You, you felt um, he really dictated play. And, but uh, he didn't have these guys. Which one has, I'm wondering, and I have you right now uh, asking, answering, who has better serve, Borg or Connors? Better serve. Oh, Uh, Bork had a much better serve than Connors. Oh, okay. Yeah, Connors didn't have a very good serve. I mean, I would say that was, I mean, Connors, if, and I hope he's not listening, but I mean, if you look at his game, he didn't, I mean, I thought, you know, his forehand wasn't that great. His serve wasn't that great. Uh, his volleys were, he had really good attacking volleys, but he was just the fiercest competitor. 
and and he understood like how to take time away from you and put you under pressure but the his intensity was just so much higher than the other players Sammy, yeah. somebody in the audience is asking if you think i love that question thank you everybody uh, uh, please feel free to ask questions uh, if the guys now nowadays are nice too i mean I, i don't know if you know some of the guys right now playing on the tour uh, Uh, people say that Federer is nice. I don't know. I mean, what do you, what do you know? How much you know about the players? The the ones. Uh... I I mean, I, obviously, I, I don't talk to the the top players now, uh, but I think you can see you can see a lot of. You can get an idea of someone's character by the way they uh, carry themselves, their body language. Those guys. I mean. Nadal just to me I mean those guys are such great champions and they seem like great guys and I mean I I'm like just huge fans of all all three of them because um they are they're yeah they I think they're great guys I, I Yeah but, I, but uh, no I know who is in the audience Ivan Rodrigo from Spain he was a professional player uh Ivan Ivan is asking if they They are too nice right now. You know, compared with the bad guys, remember? Uh, yeah. McEnroe, Becker, Connors. What do you yeah. think about that? No, I don't think they're too nice at all. I think it, I think it's a turnoff. The, I think it was a turnoff to have, like, McEnroe and Connors hate each other, or, you know, or McEnroe and Lindo. I think, I don't, I mean, I think tennis got a little bit of a bump, but I think, honestly, I think it, it turned people off of tennis players. Tennis players were looked at as brats. And I think but people... don't you think sorry uh, but don't you think that was also charismatic like uh, for people attractive more attractive I think it was uh charismatic at first I think it, it mm. drew more people at first but I think long term I think it helped hurts the game I think if you know people are thinking that those are brats out there that are playing versus a oh, man you know let's let's uh let's model our behavior on, on, you know, like the way that Nadal conducts himself when things don't go well and he's still a great competitor and such a great champion and he still conducts himself well. I think there's so much more to look for versus someone that... Um, and Ivan, Ivan uh, Sam is asking, pressure for brands to maintain a good image? It's a good, great question right now. That? Ivan is asking if you believe or think that the pressure from the big brands, sponsors, to maintain these guys a good image is what keeping them to, to be brought somehow and to be like a perfect figures? I, I, I mean, I'm sure that there is, uh, brands like to have someone behave well. I think it's uh, like Nadal's character. I think it's Federer's character. Uh, uh, Um, I don't have, uh, I think it's probably Djokovic. I mean, Djokovic doesn't always act well, he, mm. you know, so, so, but I do, I think it's their character and I think they're, they have a respect for the game of tennis. I think Federer has an immense respect and, and you see that with, um, that they, you know, the majors count and they play all the majors and they're looking toward history. I, I think Sampras brought that back a little mm. bit. And uh, so Stefan Edberg, I, right? Stefan Edberg. Yeah, and Edberg was a great champion. I think that makes the game better. I think it makes it more attractive. I don't think someone, I don't, you know, Curios, someone like Curios may attract people for a little bit, but I think people get turned off and, uh, and then they're not going to really want to watch tennis and they're not going to really want to play tennis. Uh, so I, I don't. I don't agree. And if you look at the numbers for uh, who play, how many people play tennis, if you look at the numbers, like mm. in the 1980s to like 1983, the numbers were going way, you know, they went way up, like 70, 76 to 83, the numbers, and then they just crashed. They went from like 40 million to 17 million people that play. Mm. And I think it was just the, all of a sudden tennis was not, It wasn't like a sportsmanship sport. It wasn't. I, I think that, I think it matters, but that's just my opinion. Of course, of course. Uh, th and if, I, I love listening and learning what you say. You were there with all these guys. Uh, and finally, 
uh, all the Argentinians are waiting for Vilas. How how was it like to play with against Guillermo? You know, he's not uh, health wise. He's not doing well right now. You know, um, but um, uh, he was yeah. he was an amazing champion. He had a, that 1977 run was amazing. Playing against him in the finals, I I didn't really give myself a chance. You know, he was was in was Houston, a, a right, like, Sammy? Houston. Hmm? Houston. I played him in the finals of River Oaks, which was my first pro tournament. And I beat some good players to get there. I beat like Dibs and some, some other good players. And um, so it was a surprise that I was in the finals. And, but um, playing him, I just didn't think that I had a chance. But he was, he was similar to playing like Boar. He hit mm. really heavy topspin. It didn't always go that deep. You kind of, I felt like with both of them, you felt like you were controlling the point but you really weren't because you never really got him out of position. You know, it was hard mm -hmm. to hurt them. Uh, Vilas ran and he, you know, and he got a ton of balls back and he just made you play every ball. And Sorry, uh, Sammy, a great champion, Victor Pecci is watching you right now. Oh my gosh, I watch, I used to watch Victor Pecci play at River Oaks all the time. I would sneak into River Oaks Oh, and he would. I watched. I think he, one year he played Harold Solomon in the quarters or semis, if I'm correct. Uh, played. I loved his game. I loved watching him because there was contrast to the two handers with his slice back oh. and him trying. It was just gorgeous to watch him. Him trying to get to net. I love watching contrasting game styles. I think it makes the game so interesting. So I love I love watching him at River Oaks. I now now some, he's he's listening to you right now. I got to see some what's uh, just uh, Victor. I got to see some great matches and and it was really inspiring getting to see you play when when I was a, um, younger. He's a Wonderful. great player. I had a, a two hour conversation with Victor last year. Oh wow! Oh yeah, yeah. We, so Sammy, um, tell me about. The, we, we talked privately about the, one of the topics is, was going to be talking about the present of the USA men's tennis. Uh, I, rem I, I was watching the, the draws when you played and um, Americans all over the place. Yes. What, what happens now, even though 10 players from USA are in the top 100. Right. But the best rank is 33, I think 32, Taylor Fritz, then, then uh, John Esner. Right. But, you know, uh, please, I, we, everybody wants to, to listen from, from uh, uh, authorized voice. And, and, and well, what, what, do you, what is your opinion about uh, men's tennis? And, the, and women's tennis is doing pretty well, by the way. Yeah. Uh, well, everyone has an opinion on this. But, you know, when, when I was playing, I think there was probably like 60 to 70 guys in the top 100 in mm. the U.S. that were in the top 100 in the world. Like 60 or 70 guys in the U.S. that were Americans that were like top 100. So America was very dominant in tennis back then. And I think a big part of it is that most of the circuit was over in America. And mm. now you, you had a pivot to Europe uh, for you know, the bigger tournaments. And we don't have an, I don't, I feel like the biggest mistake, it's not coaching. I, I've heard, um, I've heard a lot of people like question our kids' character, like kids just are kind of spoiled or they're too mm. soft and that stuff. And it's just, a, to me, it's a bunch of malarkey because I, I see the kids that we work with, they're not soft, they're, you know, hard workers and they don't mind working for things. It's there's not much of a pathway. There's not many ITF junior tournaments. There's not many ITF future tournaments. There's not that tournament infrastructure for kids to a kid that's 16 or 17. He has to go to Europe and play those tournaments now, or he has to travel all over the U.S. And when you look at the U.S., it's geographically the size of Western Europe mm. and population it's uh, similar as Western Europe. So, uh, you know, so Spain has as many 
future tournaments as U.S. does. Spain is 40% the size of Texas. Mm. So that's just, you know, if, 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 I, if our kids could go and play future tournaments and play the qualifying on Saturday and then lose and then come back on Monday, there's not a lot of cost to that. Mm. They can keep training. They can keep their training going. They can, but, but now they, you know, um, now that's the cost. If you fly to California or you fly to Europe, you got hotels for that whole week. You got, mm. so, it, it, so Americans don't really, if they don't make it right away, a lot of them just kind of disappear. Mm. And, and they're good players. But it, as and they, go, that, they choose to go to college, right? They go to college, but that's, you can still make it out of college. But when you come out of college, very few players are going to make it right away. So, you know, now it's taking a lot of players four or five years to get on the tour where, well, mm. most, most Americans can't afford to pay that, you know, to, you know, to, you know, 50, 100 grand a year to try to travel and do it right, right? To, And it's happening, sorry, the same situation is happening with South Americans, uh, Sammy, uh, because we, we, but we always been through that because yeah. I, uh, we are so far south, you know? Yeah, no, I can see that. I mean, I think... Uh, I think that, yeah, that, we'll, I lost you. I lost you a little bit. Okay, we are back. No, I'm telling you this. Yes, go ahead. The, go ahead. The trick, I think, what's the key is having that infrastructure. You have the tournament infrastructure. You're going to try to attract the players. That you're going to give your players a chance to play those events and get it. You're going to get your chance, your players a chance to see and see the players, and they get to feel it, touch it. They'll get to practice against them. You know, that's what makes players better. It's not, you, you can't just train in a vacuum and then show up and be really good. You need that. You need to see that level. You need to play against that level. And if we don't have a lot of tournaments in your city or around you, then those kids are missing that. And I feel like, like when I was coming up, I was, uh, I went from a decent junior to a, a ranked pro. Because mm -hmm. I had a lot of, I was practicing against guys that were 100 in the world, 150 in the world. And then all of a sudden I would beat them a couple of sets and I'd say, oh, wow, maybe I can play the circuit. But it never really occurred to me before that, that I could play the circuit. And that's what gave me the confidence when I went out there. But if I didn't have that, then I wouldn't really have a vision or a pathway to see how I could make it. And I think that's what we're missing. Yeah, and I, 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 I worked with Nick Balatieri. I, I, I coached at Nick right. uh, in two different periods, Semi. And Nick always said that back in the 80s, when he started the academy, he gathered all the guys together, you know, big group of guys, Curry, Agassi, right. you name it, Anacon, Gilbert, also foreign players, Pablo Araya, um, and women too, a lot of good players. Um, And this is what is missing, he said. Uh, having the guys fighting, battling in the, in the courts, pushing right. each other, pushing each other. Um, like, look like everyone is doing their own job, right? Like separately and, right? Right. I, I, I mean, I, I think what Nick did was amazing um, that, you know, he brought the better players together. I don't know if I agree that that's the solution, though. I feel okay. like... I feel like Uh, in the 70s and when we were dominant, everyone was kind of training where they were. They weren't going to another academy. Mm. They weren't going, you know, I, I don't know if it's really good for a kid to leave their home when they're 14 and um, play, uh, you know, train a month, you know, two months away from their parents. I, I just don't think that's really great for them emotionally and, and sp spiritually and everything. I think they need that support of their family. So I don't really agree with that as a solution. I just think we need more tournaments. And tournaments. Uh, US, okay. USTA has been big on like, okay, it's our coaching, it's this it's, or that, but they kind of ignore our infrastructure. And or at least I think they, they, or they don't think it's an issue. And I, and I really think it is. And I think that's what, I mean, if we want to be as dominant, if we want to have as many, if the U.S. wants to have as many players in the top 100 as Western Europe, 
I think we have to have as many future tournaments and ITF juniors and as many events as, as Western Europe. And we're not close in the um, for futures and, and stuff that Western and when, Europe. And when you watch, uh, talking about now, more technical question, Sammy. When you watch the American players, they almost all tall. They have big serves, big forehands, backhands, mm, mm -hmm. slice, slice, <laughs> not as strong as, you know, the best in the world. Variation in their game, really not at all. So compared with the Europeans, Sammy, right now, nowadays, also I see that trend. I mean, the lack right. of variation. It's just Opelka style. Big sir, big fork, and that's it. Mm -hmm. what, what, is, what is your philosophy? Uh, your, I, I want to hear from you. That. Well, I think we always have uh, different game styles that come out of the U.S. I mean, I don't, I, I, you know, we're more hard ports here. So, mm. yeah, we're going to have more bigger server, servers, maybe flatter hitters than Europe, mm. maybe a little less variety. Uh, but if you get the fundamentals right uh, and have really good fundamentals, then the, our players should be able to adapt. And I think, you know, Sampras, you could say, oh, but he was limited to what he could do, but he could adapt because he, he had really good fundamentals and he was a good competitor. And so, I think I, I don't I don't really believe that's the issue that we're our games are you know Isner and Opeko are one style. Um, I think um, Tiafo plays a different style. Fritz plays a different style. You know, so I think we have some different style players. Some some of our Americans that come up have better backhands and forehands. So it's it's I don't think it's. Uh, Yeah, but someone I, who played uh, who played with uh, Sampras, uh, Ivan Rodrigo, writing said, uh, actually he congratulated you. He said Sampras was very complete. Todd Martin was very complete. Uh, uh, we, you could say Sampras had a weaker backhand. I mean, he did have a weaker backhand. Sampras was very complete at that yeah. time, uh, mm -hmm. much more complete than the players at, at that time. But... Uh, I don't know. I mean, like players, like I, I would say like a player like Brad Gilbert, he wasn't very complete when he first came on the circuit, but all of a sudden his serve got better and then his backhand got better and then he could volley and he just kept improving. And that's, that's what the players need to do. They get on the circuit. They don't, I don't, I feel like they have to have a couple weapons and then they can keep improving. Uh, I mean, you want to give them as many tools, but they, it's just because they don't have all the weapons when they start, like, You, you see, like, Nadal and Federer, they keep improving. They, mm. they you know, Federer can now drive through his backhand, you know, and uh, Nadal started coming up to return a little closer on when he yes, was playing on yes. grass and shortening. Right, correct. You know, I mean, you see them adapt. Uh, Djokovic's forehand was a little weak when he, I think, when he first started the circuit, right? It was, it seemed to break down a little bit more. Now it's rock solid. I mean, I think the when you get on the circuit, if you're going to play another, 10 or 15 or 20 years, you, hopefully you're continuing to improve your game and rounding it off. And I think that's the attitude that players need to have. But, 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 uh, the, the, okay, based on that, what do you think uh, uh, Fritz, the Fritz, uh, Opelka, uh, Tiafo, uh, all these guys need to have, because John Isner is 35, 34, I don't think, he, he already reached his peak. Right. Uh, but, but what do you think this guy needs, Tommy Paul, uh, to break well, through, to get top, to beat? Like Andy, Roddick, Andy Roddick the other day said something really interesting, Sammy. Uh, I heard in the tennis channel said, the guys are complacent right now, the, the new generation of American players, like a complacent to be top 30, top 40, making some good money. Uh, they have to aim high, like I did, to be number one in the world. Americans always thought that high, to be being number one. Right. Um, I mean, Andy probably knows the players better than me. I think, I don't think the players are complacent. I think the players don't have a vision how they get there, because there's, there's no example for them. And oh, okay. I, think, I think that what they need to do is, 
is if we build up that base of players that are in the top 100, maybe there's 20 instead of 10 or 25, and you start getting one or two to break through, hmm. then that will give the others the confidence that they can do it. I don't think it's a game that's holding these players back. It's, 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 it's the vision of them seeing themselves, you know, and that they can make the finals of Wimbledon or they can win Wimbledon or they, you know, that that's a possibility and they need, they need each other. They, one of them needs to break through. Hmm. And then I think a lot of, the, the light will go on for a lot of the others that it's possible. And I think that's what happened, like, in the Sampras generation. Uh, Chang won the French Open, and it was kind of a fluke. But it it lit everyone up. Courier, Sampras, you know, those guys, Agassi, you know, oh, Ch if Chang can, you know, I've been competing against Chang all my life. If Chang can win a French Open, maybe I can do it. And I think that's what we're missing a little bit. We're not having Roddick. Was Roddick the last person that American that won? Yes. Two, 2003, he won the U.S. Open and the last actually. In that's, one. that's a long time. 18, yeah. 80 years. Yeah. So I think they're, they're probably, uh, you know, they're probably need those guys need to, the fitness is so important. And those guys probably, they're going to need a guy to really, really work hard and get his fitness amazingly they, they got to push that to the next level i think i think that's might be what's holding them back a little bit i think the fitness is is a um, big challenge and i and i agree with you with some of these guys have some good matches good 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 times but it uh, looks like they don't believe in themselves when they play these big guys exactly. yeah you, you see them there you see them there and you're like I mean, TFO's been there close, and yeah, and Isner's beaten some players, and it's like, okay, they're right there. They're you know, they could break through. They you know, but uh, I don't think I don't think they believe yet, and I don't. I think they had to put in. I mean, I guess Roddick might be right in the sense that they probably have to do a a lot more physical work than mm. what they're doing. I I don't know their training, so I'm I'm talking blind, but. No, it's fine. Those those fine. top players are, you know, to to get through a Grand Slam and win seven matches, and you play, you know, back to back five set matches in two or three days like that. that yeah. takes that takes a different level of fitness and uh, to be able to recover and have your body, and it, it's a different level of discipline. And so, I, I don't know. I think I think that's. I mean, that's what I would guess is probably more tied to fitness. And if they had that fitness, they might believe a little bit more. Great, uh, Sammy, wonderful. Um, to finalize this wonderful talk, uh, I wanna be, ask you, request you to please give uh, all the junior players that are going to listen to this uh, conversation um, some advices, some uh, to, oh, wow. for those 14, 15, 16, they, they dream about becoming professional players one day. Uh, what they will have to, of course, you talk about fitness, but tennis wise, they give them some advice, mental from the mental, well, based in your experience. I think to understand their why, you know, what, why are they, why do they really want to, you know, what do they really want and why? and understand their motivation. And because, um, you know, that spirit that goes along, that's what makes you a great competitor. And like, if you don't, if you lose that, if you lose that why and like that purpose to where you play um, and what you're working at, then then you won't have that will in a, in a tight match to, to stay mm -hmm. tough. And, and then the second thing I would say is just like, you know, small victories, like it's like, you know, just just worry about getting a little bit better every time and, and not like, OK, you, you might have a setback or whatever, but uh, keep just keep improving, just keep getting a little bit better. You don't have to, you know, you, you know that those cumulative uh, victories or those cumulative improvements are going to make a huge impact and keep seeing your vision of Hey, if I keep doing this, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be the top. I'm going to be the best. Now, I'm, you know, I'm talking from someone that's never done it. So, 
uh, you know, I'm talking blind. Uh, so, you know, it'd be probably a much better question for someone like Victor or some of these <laughs> Guillermo or something that, that really has done. But that's, that's what I feel. That's just from, from being with the kids and seeing how they work and what, uh, how their minds work and stuff. I think that's what, uh, those are the advice I would give. No, thanks, Sammy. No, it was, it was wonderful. Listen, you're too humble. Uh, because uh, you you being top in the world, you were a top player, so so it's fine. Uh, you achieved a lot, uh, Sammy. Uh, wonderful. Last question before I let you go. Uh, the best player, tennis player, male, and the best female that you ever seen. You can choose more than one, okay? If you want. Well, the best male, I would say, is. I have to give Federer the nod right now, and, and the doc can pass him up, but Federer's been in more finals, and he's been, I think he's been more dominant when he was dominant. So, I, I, and, um, so I'd probably give the nod, and he's been more complete. Like, Nadal's won 13 Frenches. I think Federer's are more balanced, so, although he hasn't won a lot. He has only won one French. But, so I, I just give him the nod. Uh, but Nadal and Djokovic are right there. Um, so for the women, I, I guess I, you know, I got to go probably with Serena. Uh, I love Monica Seles. She was, mm. I just, I thought she played with so much joy and passion. Mm. So I, I love uh, watching her. Um, and then I love also uh, labor just seemed like such a humble guy. And so that, those are probably who. I like Borg and Borg too. He was my idol, so I got it. You know, Perfect. He's probably not, and 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 that I can't give him that because he didn't win the major. So, is it that many is better than them did and last as long? Awesome, awesome. So, Sammy, thank you so very much for your time. You were very eloquent. Like uh, people from Spain say, very humble and eloquent. So, so wonderful, wonderful having you. And uh, I, 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 I mean. Uh, I love it. I had a great time. I hope you, you had a great time, too. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for having me. This was fun. Thank you. I love it. Bye. Hi to everybody. And I hope I, if I stop by, I can, and I can visit your place. Eh, that would good, be good. I hope you do. I hope you do. Yeah, yeah. We are here right. in the same country. So. All right. I know. I know. You're in California, aren't you? Or yes. Yes. Yeah. Irvine. Irvine. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. So all the big colleges. Yeah. Yeah. USC, uh, yeah, very near UCLA. So, yeah, very, very good. Very good place. Yeah. Very nice yeah. place. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, uh, and uh, stay in touch. Okay? All right. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Sammy. All Thanks, right. everybody. And uh, Amir, thank you for uh, the father of one of my students. Uh, so was there uh, listening so thanks Amir I'll see you later with Russia. all right see you. thank bye. you so much bye bye take care bye bye